you. Thank you. Good, good morning, everybody. And uh, let me say it's a, it's a great uh, pleasure and privilege to uh, be the, uh, the, the, the first... Uh, if I say technical speaker, I know Ian won't be uh, offended after his uh, very interesting and, and, uh, and uh, very significant, I think, uh, opening re remarks. Thank you, Ian. Well, the, working with Doug um, on his EME calculator software, I found myself thinking how useful this... Uh, system analysis tool would have been in the early years of amateur moon bounce. Of course, we knew how to calculate the basic parameters using the radar equation, but we had much less information on antenna characteristics, the sort of information that Paul W1GH said has provided on the, in the online antenna handbook. Now, I've applied some of these analysis tools to the systems of the 1960s and 70s to estimate their performance, and in some cases, to compare these with the results from the records. Now, I'm going to cover the start of amateur EME and the early technology used and describe some of the stations, but there's a lot more detail in the long version of the, in the paper and the DVD. And I should say right at the start, I know I've missed people out, and I just hope any people I've missed out won't be offended um, and... Uh, and uh, uh, you know, if they uh, if if they f if, <clears throat> if they feel offended, drop me an email. I'll make sure if the DVD ever gets am amended, I'll put them in. Right. So this is really where it started, what I call the Big Bang. In 1960, there were a few of us in Europe working meteor scatter and striving to get the tropo records up over 1,600 kilometres. So imagine the impact that QST for September 1960 had when it landed on the doormat. And this really was the, you know, the, the, the first time we knew this had, uh, this had happened. It was truly mind-blowing. And so everywhere that there was serious VHF, UHF work going on, the thoughts were, how can we copy that? How do we, uh, what do we need? What do we need to do to, uh, to build something like this? In most cases, uh, it meant, how can we do it at 432? Because there was at least the chance there of generating some power. Uh, Klystrons at 1296 were just completely beyond the imagination. But that's a, uh, that, was, that was a great occasion when that uh, arrived. Now, I call Sam Harris the father of, of, uh, of, of EME because although there were, there were signals received before then, it was Sam that made the first, uh, the first QSO. And we owe the, the start of amateur EME to the skill and drive and determination of this man. I love this photo. You know, it says that we don't use ladders. This old bit of towel will do to uh, go up to the feet. It's quite dangerous, actually, to do that. Um, but tremendous advances were being made in this uh, era in solid-state devices and in low-noise techniques, primarily in parametric amplifiers. So the equipment was around professionally. But how they put it all together and made it work is a fascinating story, and you can find a lot of detail in the, uh, in the references. So why did success come at 1296? when the first 144 meg echoes had been detected in 1953? The answer's in this graph. The sky noise, I could probably point, here we are. It's here somewhere. Okay. The, answer's, um, the answer is in this, uh, in this graph. The sky noise uh, from the cosmic background down here, the... Um, the, the galaxy and the atmosphere, sets a limit on how noise-free um, the receiving system can be. Now, we express this noise as a temperature, and this curve shows how it varies with frequency. So note this window here between about 1 and 10 gigahertz, and note how much higher the, the, uh, the, the noise is here um, at, um, at, at, at 144. So until paramps came along at 432 and 1296 megahertz, the inherent receiver noise swamped the sky noise, and the noise figure of a good mix was 6 or 7 dB in those days. That was what you had. So, you had, so, the, so the paramp was an absolute revelation, dropped this to uh, 1.5 dB. So what, uh, what, what happened next? Quite a, quite a few stations in the USA and HB9RG here in Europe copied the 1296 signals from W1BU, but the next actual QSOs didn't happen until 1962. The two-meter um, uh, uh, two gang finally made a QSO 
uh, with Europe at one end, OH1NL, one of the great meteor scatter operators of those days, sadly no longer here. But there was little 1296 activity again until 1964 when HB9RG made the first QSO out of Europe on that, uh, on that band. However, in June 1964, the, the, the story went round that uh, uh, KP4BPZ would be on from Arecibo with a thousand foot dish. Uh, there wasn't a lot of notice and people were very skeptical, but I'd already got a 15 foot dish built and a paramp and a 300 watt PA, and so I made my first, uh, my first QSO. But a year later, KP4BPZ was back. Um, a lot louder on sideband as well as CW and with some mains hum, hum on the signal. And this time they worked 28 stations. So if we could play the first audio clip, uh, Tim, audio one. Okay, well, that is um, that. That was uh, that was Sam Harris on the mic on that uh, on that recording. Um, that was all pretty exciting, as you can imagine, in in those days. Um, so this is just a slide of the of, of two of the antennas that were used in uh, in the in the very early 60s to receive signals from W1BU. Those original signals. This is HB9RG um, on the side here with his uh, with his dish down there in in in, in Switzerland. Um, now, the, the 1965 KP4 BPZ operation gave a very big boost to 432 activity. And during the test, some people heard the slightly smaller station of WA6LET, 250-foot dish, um, and were later able to work them. And the 60-foot Crawford Hill dish in New Jersey was activated by Dick Turin, W2IMU, one of the other f true fathers of EME, and gradually, the smaller 20-foot dish stations started to make QSOs help with the presence of these big dish stations in activity weekends, just the same as we're doing today with the, uh, on the, uh, on the, on the uh, medium microwave bands. So the... So the... So... Oh, I'm sorry. So, yeah. The, the, the Crawford... Hit, the Crawford Hill dish was activated several times on 1296 between 1968 and 1973. And as a result, several smaller stations made their first QSOs on that band. WB6IOM was a prominent station on 1296 in 68-69, and I worked him to create a new distance record. The slide shows our equipment. The white 16-foot dish of WB6IOM was fabricated from aluminium-coated fiberglass honeycomb glued together on a solid concrete mould in his garage. My, my, my dish is the proof that your, all, your dish will always work at two or three times higher at the frequency than you think it will. <laughs> that, uh, it does look pretty shabby at, uh, at, at this stage. Now, if we can play audio two, just before we do, this is the 1296 signal from WB6IM sending long dashes, uh, which was used as a report, rather like we use O's today, and followed by a recording from Crawford Hill, W2NFA, with Dick, W2NFU, um, greeting me. He sends, good morning, good morning, Peter, a few times, and then sending my report. So if we could have audio two now, please, Tim. Thank you.
Okay, can't take too much of that. <laughs> well, EME then starts to expand rapidly, especially on 432, aided by things like regular, regular schedules, which, um, uh, and then, of course, the newsletter, which uh, Ian has already mentioned, and the W2 IMU EME notes, which are still uh, very useful today. So by 1980, there were probably 80 to 100 people active on 432. SSB, slow scan TV, circular polarization had all been experimented with and on this band. And in 1980, regular activity started on 1296 by about three or four uh, stations. So now we'll look at the, uh, have a look at the technology. As I explained earlier, the only way to get low noise amplification at 432 and 1296 in 1960 was with a parametric amplifier or a paramp. Now this shows my 1296 one, and they were quite tricky to get working well, but I ran this one up again recently, and it measured 1.5 dB noise figure and 20 dB gain. With this in the shack, of course, you needed a very low loss feed line. Typically this was pressurized, air spaced, 25 millimeter or larger helical membrane. Mine had a five meter, mine was a five meter run with about 0 0.6, 0 0.8 of a dB loss. You can actually see it in that previous, uh, that previous picture. So the, 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 the reason the parent was so tricky was that there were really so many things to adjust. There was loading, there was, there was the tuning of the signal, the tuning of the idler cavity, getting, keeping the pump um, ca cavity resonant, the level uh, of, the, of the pump, the frequency, um, in fact, the, in the early systems, we had, we had uh, two, two loadings, an input and an output, for reasons that I'll go into if anyone's interested in the bar. But they work pretty, uh, pretty tricky. Anyway, so now to the next slide. So tr this is what I call transistors to the rescue. So by the mid-60s, low-noise transistors were starting to appear. And this slide shows the dramatic process over 15 years on those two bands. And of course, as soon as you could get enough gain to mount the LNA at the feed and have the overall noise figure, including the mixer, in the shack, better than about 2.5 dB, the paramp became redundant. And the problem with the tuning of the paramp was then replaced by blowing up the rare and costly transistors, <laughs> which was a serious problem in those days. But it's quite an interesting curve, this. By, by 1985, 1986, we were down to the half dB uh, reg region. So now to transmitters. Transmitters for EME are for EME a continual struggle to get enough power. 1296 was much harder than 432, where we used either big single tubes or the K2ROW with its parallel 4CX250Bs. And as described here, the great majority used multiple 3CX100A5 triodes. To get more power per tube, the air cooling fins were removed and replaced by a water jacket. And the results could be spectacular in several ways. <laughs> now, for so what we see here um, are some examples of these amplifiers. Now, my homemade six-tube water-cooled ring amplifier has been running for 30 years now. It gives about 700 to 800 watts. And Hans OZ9CR, who one of the great EMEs of those of those days, made 60 or 70 of these in his workshop and sold them for essentially just the cost of the, of the brass. It made a real contribution to, uh, to getting people on the air on, on, uh, on 23 centimetres. And there are also two tube variants and, eight, and, a, and an eight tube variant, which I only, I only heard of one other person than WB6, so I'm getting this to work. Um, but there was, uh, that, that would give um, 800 watts plus uh, at 1296. This was the two tube version, which, which, which really... Uh, um, wasn't terribly efficient. There were much better versions came along um, from uh, from the from the Crawford Hill uh, from the Ho Crawford Hill people. So, for information on how we solve pr other problems such as frequency stability and getting sufficient frequency accuracy, you have to see the DVD version. Most of the time, as you could hear from those recordings, we were working with 100 hertz filters or less. And so those topics did present some, uh, some, some, some problems. <laughs> One of the things, putting this together, I, I, when, I was, when I was playing some of these old recordings into uh, things like Spectran, 
I realized how much chirp there was on the frequencies. I'd never, you know, it's, and of course when you listen to it, you can hear it. But I'd never noticed it on those days. And of course, in some cases, it was actually chirping through the, uh, through, through the filter. So for antennas on 1296, we start off with deep dishes and dipole reflectors. But we soon move to circular guide to get higher edge illumination and more ERP because we were limited in noise figure and transmitter power. Circular polarization was adopted as a standard in 1969, again with the lead, under the leadership of, uh, of, of Dick Turner and the Crawford Hill crew. And in 1970, Dick published his classic dual-mode feed horn design, which you know, is still around. We're going to see more of that in this conference. And with transistor LNAs at the feed horn, the system temperatures really started to fall, as we'll see in a later slide. Now this slide here, and I apologise for the, the quality for, of some of these slides, but it's, you know, it's, it's been a matter of scanning old black and white pictures in. And, uh, but I, th I think it will give you the, the idea. The beautiful dish of PA0 SSBs, which is still around, still there, 0.6 F to D, 48 ribs. It's got the dual mode forward feed horn fitted there. It can be raised up and down because uh, of the, to keep it out of the, uh, out of the wind. And the OZ9CR picture, which was uh, another dish of that, that era, I think that's the 432 feed in place on that. But, uh, um, and, and I think in the, in the DVD picture, there's a picture of his circular polarized 432 feed, which is uh, pretty, uh, pretty unusual. So looking now at 432 antennas, at the start, the majority of 432 antennas were dishes with dipole and later dual dipole reflectors, either rotatable or switched to combat the Faraday rotation. The Yagi designs improved and big arrays started to appear with, big, with signals from big signals from stations such as F9FT and DL9KR. And Yan, of course, is still the outstanding signal on 432, and I, I, uh, I think he's over 110 DXCCs, but he can, uh, he can correct me on that uh, later on. So a lot of skill and engineering and know-how went into achieving low-noise, high-gain Yagi arrays of the type shown here. One component of success is paying a lot of attention to the phasing lines and individual antenna VSWRs. And finally, I just want to mention collinear full-wave arrays, which the older ones amongst you will remember. Um, and this one is, is one that uh, W1JR made, uh, and the, and the complete, it's completely rotatable in polarization. So this is about 1974. Um, it wasn't until quite a bit later that back-mounted Yagi arrays, pioneered by Tim K or 7 WEs, uh, ca uh, came in. So I'm going to try now to pull this together a bit and, and uh, get to uh, some conclusions. To maximize the, to maximize the receive sensitivity we need to maximize the G over T ratio, where G is the antenna gain and T is the system temperature. And the principal components of T, the, the system temperature, are the sky temperature, uh, T sky, which we spoke about yes, uh, uh, earlier, remember the, the bucket-shaped uh, curve, and T receiver, TRX, which contains the, um, the, and, uh, which contains the LNA noise figure and the associated losses, and T antenna, which has got the spillover uh, and side lobes in it. Now, this next slide, um, digging out from the archives, um, and it shows how fast the system temperatures decreased uh, between 1960 and 1980. Uh, and you can see actually here, this, this, this peak here, um, uh, the effect of going for uh, going for maximum uh, uh, maximum gain, maximum uh, uh, ERP, um, pushed the system temperature up. We were, we, were, we were pushing the edge illumination up. The noise figure was was uh, um, the the spillover was not a, a major contributor to the, to the system. But of course, as soon as the W two IMU horn came along, with its much better characteristics, and then and then um, low noise transistor amplifiers came along the whole thing started to, uh, to drop um, uh, much faster. 432, um, not so much change. The, we're going we're we're to wait until we hear from Ingolf later on about uh, better feeds for, uh, for 432. But uh, 
Um, certainly during this era, the best we were, the best we were using was the EIA, um, the dual dipole feed, two dipoles uh, fed in phase over, over a reflector. And that's the sort of shape the system um, temperature curve was taking, driven mainly by the, um, uh, by the improvements in transistors. So I apologise that this slide is slightly on the skew, but it was, uh, was quite, uh, quite hard to, uh, to uh, get together. So finally, what I did was to plot G over T versus dish diameter for the early days and today. So the, so the early ones the early ones are around here. There's actually an error. I think that one under me says 73. It should say 74, but anyway. Um, and these... And these uh, uh, ones up here are the, are the, are the modern um, G over, G over T uh, figures for, um, and the dish diameter along the bottom here. Uh, if, anyone's, uh, if anyone feels missed out, they can, um, they can stick their uh, numbers on the, on the curve afterwards. The reason W2NFA is, is out here way off the curve, that was the 60-foot dish at Crawford Hill, is that it had a tremendously long feed line, feed line. And so uh, that, that really, uh, really did um, spoil their, uh, their performance. And I should also have mentioned that that, that recording of them, the re one of the reasons that was so weak was that they were only running about 50 watts at the, uh, at the feed on that, at that occasion. So you can see where we started and where we are today. Now today the receiver noise contribution is comparable to that of the antenna and so sacrificing some gain by choosing a feed that under-illuminates the dish you can improve the G over T. In fact, it's easy to see this on EME count because there's a very F, F to D function. So you can, uh, you, you can, you can see the effect um, very easily. And I believe we're pretty much now at the limit on where we, on 1296 and 13, but sorry, on 1296, but on 13 and above, there's still plenty to do with feeds and, and, um, and LNAs. Just coming back to this curve, um, I mean, this was, you, you can see W1BU, KH6UK, which, is, which were the first, the first uh, two QSOs on, uh, on 23 centimetres. Um, and these, uh, um, these, these lines here pretty much follow um, um, a, a square law because um, if everybody was using the same system temperature, then the G over T uh, would, would uh, vary as a square law because the the, the, the gain is the square of the, of the diameter. Um, but, um, and you can see here, uh, as soon as, the, as, soon as the, the, you know, the better feed started, the, uh, the W2 IMU feed started, and the, um, uh, and the, and the lower noise transistors, um, the, 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 the G over T ratio started to increase. But what is also surprising is that um, you know, I, I thought when I started this, I'd find sort of 10, 15 dB differences, but it, but it isn't really as, as, mu as much as that. Right, I think. So, so trying to really draw some conclusions now. First of all, there, there were some amazing um, antennas built in those, in those days. I think, that, that I think really PA0SSB's antenna was uh, a dish was was really quite uh, quite a fantastic uh, um, piece of, of building for those days and the, and the big Yagi arrays as well. But because we were always short on power and high on noise figure, the antenna size was the only place that we could make that up. And there were some amazing dishes built, as I just said. So things improved rapidly. New designs for feed and for preamps with the latest transistors travel fast around the community. Ian mentioned that just now with his comments about the newsletter. Um, you know, in, in those days, probably uh, uh, every, uh, every other month there'd be a new preamp in the, in the back of the newsletter and uh, people would be uh, trying to get the transistors to, uh, to build that. The other thing is, looking back through the letters and the reports, it's pretty clear that it, pretty much everybody had trouble with tracking and pointing and just simply finding the moon. And with the low signal levels, this is often the reason for failure to make or complete uh, uh, contacts. And, um, of course, we had, uh, you know, we, had, we had only the nautical almanacs in most cases to get the moon position from, and so you'd interpolate 
from one day to the, uh, to the other. It wasn't until quite a while later that uh, we started to be able to, to uh, have PCs and, uh, and, and calculate the, um, uh, the moon position for ourselves. But as I said here, we had a tremendous amount of fun and we still do today. So any questions? And please have a look at the DVD um, for more detail on all the stations of the early days. Thank you. Thank you.